If you had all of the data in the world at your hands, what question would you answer first? That's today's big question, and my guest is Dr. Emma Pearson. Emma is an assistant professor of computer science at the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech and a computer science field member at Cornell University with a secondary joint appointment as an assistant professor of population health sciences at Weill Cornell Medical College. She's written herself for the New York Times, 538, The Atlantic, Washington Post, Wired, all my favorites. Now, I wanted to talk with her so bad because her work, her team's work, has helped unlock answers and solutions to some of our biggest, most lingering, and also sometimes most urgent questions. This is important, not important. I'm trying to answer deeply human questions, questions that you can explain to your grandmother and that, in fact, I, I, I do explain to my grandmother, uh, who is one of the, the most ultimate faithful test, right? readers of... Uh, Right, exactly. Like, can can you? I mean, my my grandma happens happens to have a a, a PhD or two, so she's perhaps unusual as standard ninety year olds go. But, but you know, as, as one does. Um, but but what I mean by that is, you know, we're we're not studying sort of abstruse technical questions that only nerds in in basements care about, right? Mm -hmm. Like we might be pursuing them using cutting edge methods and terabyte scale data, but ultimately the questions we're trying to answer are things like. How much are rich people and poor people mixing in cities? Or are the police racially biased in whom they search? Or, you know, why are black patients with knee pain, you know, experiencing greater pain than apparently similar white patients? You know, sure. so these are, they're, they're not like, uh, they're easy, easy to explain and easy to think about, even though the methods you pursue them might be advanced uh, AI methods. So... I want to come back to your grandmother in just a moment, um, but it almost seems as if this is like low-hanging fruit, right? Like you don't have to reach to try to find these questions, obviously, and, you know, we try to spin things in a very future positive way here as much as we can, but don't skip over the hard stuff, obviously. But enormous systemic problems should bring great opportunities as long as we can work towards uh, ways and reputable ways and measurable ways to, to, to achieve those or to at least work towards them. Um, but I'm curious of, and again, I tried to understand uh, the, the scope of your work and the particulars of it as much as I could, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, of all of those, because there's very many to choose from <laughs> among what you've done and, and what's out there available to you. It's a, it's a potpourri of old, old problems. Um, how many of them do you feel like we're able to try to understand for the first time now with, with some of the tools at your disposal and, and your team uh, versus ones we have tried to answer before and maybe not done a good job? Or are you trying to really get it over the hump and say, no, look, like th these are principles people have had before, but here is the data? Or are they entirely new ones where we go, hey, listen, for the first time, we can really measure this stuff? So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think in some cases, for example, let's take police discrimination. Sure. Um, it would be incredibly arrogant and false to pretend that we are the first people who have looked uh, at, the, at this question, right? You know, sure. numerous prior sources of work attest to this being an issue. Um, but, you know, what we were able to do, I think, is look at it on a scale that had previously been difficult. So specifically what we did in that project was we sort of demanded data from police departments spanning the entire United States and collected that data uh, into a single standardized uh, database. And then we analyzed it using machine learning methods uh, that were only possible to run at that scale due to a number of mathematical innovations. And so it very much was building on, you know, an enormous amount of prior work as well as like the lived experiences of minority drivers, um, but it was it was sort of doing so on a scale that had previously been quite different, uh, d difficult, uh, due due in part to the fact that like pre uh, police data in the United States is just yeah, it, it's a it's a mess basically. Yeah, sure. So, so so yeah. In other cases, um, I think you can do stuff that really is qualitatively new and, and sort of difficult to do previously. So, so I'll give you an example of this. You know, when we were trying to understand um, disparities in pain between white and black patients with knee pain, sure. um, a central focus of that study was, can we train an artificial intelligence model to predict from an x-ray of the patient's knee uh, their level of pain and maybe sort of pick up on features that the doctor is not missing, but or, that the doctor is missing, but are sort of disproportionately 
affecting minority patients. So sort of, can we use AI to find signal in the image that the doctor is missing? And this is really, you could not do this more yeah. than about, you know, five to That's ten years That's pretty nuanced ago. The stuff. technology just was not there. Yeah. Like you just didn't, we just didn't, we didn't have the, the AI models that were capable of doing this thing. So it's, it's intrinsically a very modern project that would be difficult to do before. Um, I mean, all science builds on prior science in, in, in some way. Sure. But I, but I think that's sort of an example of something qualitatively new. And, and there's sort of, you know, when we analyze these things or when we seek to analyze them or, 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 or hear about a problem like this that makes you go, oh, that's interesting, or what the hell is going on with that, um, which often the best science comes from, right, which is the, what the hell, what is this? Um, <laughs> it seems like with, again, whether we're analyzing um, – uh, policing or pain or pregnancy or uh, all these different things, um, college admissions, mortgages, whatever, all, all, all this different stuff, which, which historically we've, we've tackled pretty recently or, or trying to, it seems like there's three prongs that have kind of come along and, and in, a, in a increasingly powerful and structured way, but also we're finding that they're messy and correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to be the actual computing power, the, the chips to be able to do these sort of things. Um, the underlying foundational data, which, like you said, police data is a mess. You know, Obamacare put uh, ten to put a bunch of money to electronic health records, and and twelve years later, it's like uh, we're getting we're getting there. Uh, it's not great. Um, and then it's it's the algorithms themselves, and of course, those come from us, right? The whole alignment problem idea. So, where do you find that you are seeing? the most opportunities open up uh, on those fronts? Or do you feel like, okay, the technology is good to go? You know, what? here's what I need better data from, or we need to really think about how we're going to write these algorithms? Yeah, I think that's a very nice, uh, what, I don't know, trichotomy or something like that. It's super uh, you simplified, know, it, of course, of course. Yeah, no, 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 but, but, I, but I think that's a good way to think about it. Like, why are we seeing such unprecedented gains? Yeah, like, part of it is hardware, part of it is algorithms, and part of it is increasing availability of data. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily prioritize any one of those three as particularly important. I would say there's certainly cases where, like, data plus simple models you know, is, is on its own sufficient. Like there are cases where you can improve on the state of the art uh, using your laptop, using regression models that were, you know, developed, I don't know, hundreds of years ago or something sure. like this. Um, and then there are other cases where making progress really depends on having state of the art hardware and state of the art uh, algorithms, anything in, in deep learning is sort of going to be an example of that. Uh, deep learning being a branch of machine learning, which is very, very useful and powerful for certain types of data. Sure. For example, anything to do with text, anything to do with images. In other cases, you know, really old school modeling uh, and relatively old school hardware will, will get you a long way. How much do you still rely on old school modeling, old school hardware, or I guess how much, how often are you starting from scratch and how much are you trying to sort of build on those or stand on the shoulders of maybe some of that work that's been done or does that not exist? I don't really know what I'm talking about. No, 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 no. I think, I think it's a great question actually. Um, I would say I always do the simplest thing that doesn't seem completely stupid. Um, my God, you know, if I, I could I just a, like literally <laughs> frame that on the wall for my children and me, <laughs> like that would solve a lot of problems. Yeah. I mean, I just think with math, you know, sort of apparently still waters get deep incredibly quickly. And I really think, you know, you can have two variables in a scatter plot and confuse yourself about what's going on if you think hard enough about it. And so I try and keep things as simple as I can. Um, that said, there's sort of unavoidable complexity in modeling a very complicated world. Like you'll be like, ah, oh, like, that's not quite right. You know, this, uh, you know, there's some aspect of the data I'm not capturing here and it sure. sort of keeps you up at night. And so I think, you know, you start with the simplest possible thing, and then you you kind of find that complexity becomes unavoidable. And I think that's sort of the general general theme of my work. Could you like talk, build build on go, past work where you can, and then sure. you know innovate where you can. Could you talk me through a? And I want to get into some of the uh, the the papers you've published and, and things like that, and, and the more specific work that at least the public is aware of. But could you talk me through in a specific example where you worked in that way? Because I am curious, you know, it, again, like we kind of talked about offline, I try to frame everything here as sort of future positive, action oriented, as, as we put it, this whole 
realm of what can what can we do? What are the measurable, reputable things we can do? And so a big part of that is really thinking through how do we approach problems and how do we approach sort of the solutions or action part of this work, right? It's easy to say, like, let's find things that will help us be less racist or less, less sexist or, or, or both or all the above, right? But again, I'm curious about, like, how you hypothesize a problem, explore the data and come out on the other side um, and when and where that does lead to maybe a mechanism of some sort of action. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, so maybe take take the policing data as an example. Okay, so, so the original goal of that project was like, let's see if the police are biased in whom they search after a stop. So they stopped a driver, you know, then they have some, you know, they search some drivers. Is there sort of racial bias in whom they're searching? Sure. Now, there is like very sort of simple first pass approaches you can use to this problem. For example, you can like look at the fraction of drivers they search, break that down by race. You see like massive disparities where they're more likely to search, you know, black drivers than white drivers. Now, someone looking at that might say like, okay, fine, but maybe some drivers are just more likely to be carrying illegal things, and that's why the police are more likely to search them, so it's not actually an example of bias, rather it is an example, or bias on the part of the police, it's rather an example of sort of broader systemic disparities. So then you might say, okay, fine, well, let's not look at how likely they are to search drivers, let's look look at how likely those searches are to find anything. And so the intuition would be like, if searches of black drivers are finding something, you know, uh, only 10% of the time, but searches of white drivers are finding something 90% of the time, it's suggesting that the police are searching uh, black drivers on the basis of less evidence, right? Whereas they're searching white drivers only if they're acting really sketchy. Sure. Um, you know, that again is like a relatively simple method. Like it's just a fraction, but it's like, you know, intuitively quite revealing. Turns out there are statistical issues with that method as well, so then you can get into sort of more complex Bayesian methods. But I guess the the point being, you know, you're sort of starting with the simple things. Like you're starting with fractions, basic descriptive statistics. That's going to like get you a long way to sort of understanding basic aspects of the problem. Then you can sort of build build in complexity um, iteratively. I mean, I, I think the, the the broad point being that like there's a cost to inc- increased complexity. Um, you know, as academics, we're strongly incentivized to do fancy math, but the problem is the fancier the math gets, like the harder it is to implement, the more likely you've made a mistake or missed some subtle thing. And so this is one reason I really am a fan of simple descriptive statistics. While they, while they might be sort of an imperfect description of what in fact is happening, you know, you can at least be confident that like you understand them, you didn't mess something up, etc. And I think that's like pretty simple, you know, that, that's pretty important. I want to hold on that idea of complexity for a moment because, again, because this is – we're broad here. It's not – there's not everything. There's a specific prism of, of what we try to tackle and understand and help folks with sort of the make or break things, uh, to put it to put it lightly. Um, uh, but, you know, it's interesting because you've got climate modeling on the one hand, which, um, you know, everybody gets it now, but you talk to folks like um, – you know, Dr. Kate Marvel, who for a long time was at NASA, atmospheric science, trying to do this kind of stuff and going like, everyone's asking for projections. Where are we? Are we accounting for everything? What are the levers we're pulling? And it's it's the most complicated mass of data you could uh, ever imagine. Um, and it seems like simplification is where you kind of get in trouble. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, so much of, as I've tried to understand better, AI and machine learning and, and deep learning and things like that. When you step outside the, again, the very specific prism of like this computer is teaching itself how to play checkers or go or chess or whatever it is. When you're getting a little more broad, especially when people are involved and, and people are involved at every level, data becomes so important and it also becomes pretty controversial, right? Like we see with all these tools that are coming out every day now, 50 tools a day, people are going, well, some people are going, okay, but where is the data coming from? Where, like, like who is providing it? What is it made up of? Did they have permission? You know, et cetera, all these different things, um, which are all open-ended, complicated questions in itself. So I'm curious with something like, and you hinted at, um, you know, uh, local police data is not so reputable. I wonder if we can go back to the beginning of that project and say, what kind of I guess you tell me, like, what are the questions you ask before you start to go try to get data? Is it what kind of data do we need or um, what does it need to look like? What sort of standardized data do we need? Um, Where do we get it? What qualifies as 
reputable or useful to us? Or are those two different questions? I'm so curious because it is such an important part of how we're going to conduct these things and use these tools. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, the, the data collection effort of the, that, that um, project was led crucially by journalists, uh, you know, data journalists who had done a lot of work with, you know, policing data in the past. So specifically, like Cheryl Phillips, you know, was a journalist whose work has won multiple Pulitzer Prizes for her, you know, work on policing specifically. So she knows a lot, a lot, a lot about policing data, about how you file the public records requests and stuff like that. And, 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 you know, she, you know, she, she has been instrumental uh, in, in, and I think, you know, the project would never have been done to as high, high quality without, without her. And I think broadly domain experts, you know, if you're, if you're working with medical data, you want a clinician. Like yeah. if you're working with legal data, you want a lawyer. Like this is just a broad and recurring point because, because the problem is sort of being technically smart is not enough to anticipate like all the weirdnesses that pop up in police data. It, it's like somewhat helpful. I mean, I think, you know, certainly when we were looking at police data, there's sort of, if you're being a conscientious data scientist, stuff you can sort of see by eye that pop out at you, but then other stuff like, you know, you wouldn't necessarily anticipate. So here's, here's an example. So like the, the Texas, the Texas police department was like systematically misrecording uh, drivers with obviously Hispanic names uh, as white. They were doing so to sort of improve their numbers. Right. That's like, a, you know, I don't know. How do you know to sort of look at the name, cross reference sure. it against the race? You know, it turns out that that was exposed by some pioneering journalists down in Texas who had looked whatever. So then we as data scientists were able to sort of replicate that analysis and confirm that like, yes, it was an issue in our data, but like, you know, it's sort of hard to anticipate all these things ex ante, right? So, like, ha having people who really, like, data, data can be weird in a billion different ways. Having people who have worked carefully and deeply with the particular type of data you're working with is, like, enormously important. The other reason those people are important, by the way, is that they help you ask the important questions of the data. So, like, right. in machine learning, we, like, love to just, like, predict things, but it turns out that, like, a lot of things predicting them doesn't really matter, and doing a good job of predicting them doesn't matter. Right. And so, like, having domain experts to be like, here are the questions you should be answering is, like, you know, it's invaluable. That is always one of my, my favorite questions, is to ask a domain expert, like, I, look, I've tried to do my homework here. Uh, as I always say to people, I try to get to almost 301 level, which is a little beyond fake it till you make it, but, uh, you know, also kind of treading in dangerous waters because it becomes very clear that you're pulling at a string that uh, the sweater is very large. Um, but I do love asking the question, you know, what am I missing? Like, what questions did I ask here? And and often they can be much more nuanced and require years of expertise or education. But sometimes they're incredibly obvious just from someone who's been doing the work every day and going like, no, this is what you're missing. No, this is what you need to start with. And I imagine that's got to be pretty uh, humbling at times, right? Yeah, humbling and terrifying, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I have certain doctor, I, I you know, place late night calls to my, my sister who's a medical student and her, her husband is, you know, in, in training to be a doctor now to just ask them like basic dumb medical questions and sure. like, no one will make you feel dumb. Like your little sister. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, human, human biology is, is, is amazingly complicated and you really, you can't, you can't work it out from first principles. And yeah. I, yeah. So I think, it, yeah. I, I truly, and again, uh, you know, with, with my children, nothing is funnier than uh, my 10-year-old my the other day who's like, my friends and I invented this. I'm like, no, you didn't. That's been around for 40 years. <laughs> Stop. Um, but also, we really tried to, my wife is an incredibly hardworking, talented, successful screenwriter and producer. And, and But at the same time, you know, we're, we're very straightforward to them that like, questions are what matter and there is no dumb questions and it's one of my favorite things to again talk to someone like yourself who's just like in a completely different stratosphere and just ask the dumbest questions because for me it's so helpful because otherwise I'm not going to understand the rest of the conversation but also out there somewhere uh, among our listeners is somebody going like I really wish someone would give me like the lowest common denominator version of this so I can go on the ride with you Right. It's like in a movie where someone explains the one plot point they never talk it about again. But it's it lets the audience go like, got it. Let, they needed to do the bank robbery because X. Great. Let's let's move on. Um, sure. But it, that's great. I love that you, you know, even with everything that you have covered, you still call your sister in the middle of the night and go, what on earth is happening in this X-ray? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. So 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit, because you wrote very candidly uh, in the New York Times about uh, sort of your family story with data, as it were. Um, and I wonder if you could start with your grandmother and her two PhDs and kind of give me the story of like, your your family seems very uh, uh, ready with a sister who's, uh, I believe you said medical student and not. husband's a doctor and your grandma's got two PhDs and you're you're out here trying to solve every problem uh, we've got and understand it. But you've also got some, some, some personal investment in this. And I wonder how, if your methods changed or, or were influenced by sort of your story with that. Um, because again, with all of this, right. And as people hear AI is going to replace doctors or, or doctors are, or do better, uh, clinicians or nurses or whoever do better when they've got an AI helping them or electronic health records. I think it's also very easy for someone, a patient to go in and say, okay, who, who is giving me this answer? Where is it coming from? Whether it's genetic testing or it's long COVID or whatever it might be, to feel a little overwhelmed by sort of things that are coming at them. And how do I parse this? And I mean, Christ, nobody takes statistics classes anymore. No, We learned in COVID, no one understands probabilities, it turns out. I barely do. But that really matters these days. And again, that's very all long-winded, but I'm just so curious how that influences you as you kind of yeah. went on that journey. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I say AI is it deeply human enterprise. I mean, certainly for me, it has been, um, you know, I've, I've always been a math nerd since I was a little kid, you know, I dressed up as a chessboard when I was eight. So I, you know, <laughs> I've been consistently geeky. Um, nailing it, think, nailing it. Yeah. Oh yes. Very cool. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, when, when I was, uh, 12, uh, and my mom was 45. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she, she's fine now. She recovered. Um, but, you know, that's a striking experience to have as a little kid. And what my parents didn't tell me at, it, at the time was that, in fact, the reason she had developed cancer at such a young age was due to a, a genetic mutation uh, that, that runs through my family and confers a, an enor- abnormally high risk of many cancers, um, including, you know, breast and ovarian, but also other cancers as, sure. as well. And she got it from her dad, who ultimately died from cancer a couple of years uh, later as well. So, you know, I, I, when I was 21, I found out I, I carried um, the mutation myself. Uh, it's called the BRCA1 mutation, and Angelina Jolie is, is the much more famous carrier of the mutation. Uh, and, um, you know, I, th- I think that has profoundly influenced um, my, my interest uh, in, in AI and specifically the applications of it. You know, I went to, to college as a, as a physics major, um, and I was intending to, like, you know, use AI to study galaxies. And when I actually, like did that, what I discovered basically was I liked the AI part. Um, I didn't like the galaxies part. You know, I wanted to, wanted to focus on problems. What's your problem with galaxies? Uh, Galaxies are fine, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're mega parsecs away. Right. And I think, and, and sorry, to be clear, I'm very glad some people are studying galaxies. It's really, I think a matter of intellectual taste and personal history in terms of, in terms of, yeah, no hate to the cosmologists. Uh, Some (laughs) of my best friends are cosmologists. That's not really true. But anyway, um, so, so I think, I think that has very much, and in particular, I think, you know, I have great respect for doctors, but I also, as a patient have quite a, I think, visceral anger at the inadequacy of our medical knowledge and uh, decision making. You know, I've, I've spent more than my fair t- share of time, I think, uh, in hospitals and like hospitals are fascinating places, oh, but yeah. they're also deeply suboptimal places. Yeah, right. And, the best and I think it's even even the best of them. And I think, you know, the other thing is my interest specifically is in, in health equity and certainly you know, medical decision making becomes particularly inadequate and medical knowledge particularly incomplete, as you've noted, when it comes to, to minority populations, uh, you know, including women, racial minorities, underserved populations of, of all kinds. Uh, and, and so I think that really has has driven, um, you know, there, there's sort of the intellectual awareness that there's a lot of low hanging fruit here due yeah. to the suboptimality of decision making. But there is also sort of the visceral and emotional awareness that like <laughs> this is not this is not OK. You know, yeah. it's not OK. My wife and I have been very lucky recently to have some uh, experiences with uh, the Mayo Clinic. Um, and like you said, it's, and again, nowhere is, is perfect, but it is a little bit like visiting Star Trek for a brief period. Uh-huh. Um, both in the way the 
the soft power and the hard power, how institutionally it's built and literally how the buildings are constructed, like the, the way you go about mm. the whole thing, the way doctors are compensated, the way it's, it's uh, you know, value-driven, you know, it's a wild experience, but it also makes you go like, why is this not the thing for everyone everywhere? Like, what, what are we doing? But mm-hmm. it's a little bit like, and I was talking to my uh, daughter who um, – has decided she's a tree activist, which is very exciting. She wrote a letter to President Biden and got a letter back and just oh. greatest oh, thing. Wow. Oh, oh my God, know. she's so excited. Um, we were doing with some context. We were, we've begun puzzling because it's a really nice way for all of us to calm down at night. And we've had like 10 successive puzzle, variety of puzzles that are like incredible women through history and this and this. And one of them, uh, you know, was, was everyone from Marie Curie and, and this and that. And the, un, under each of their names was a little tag with what they actually worked on, uh, you know, their field or whatever it might have been. And many of them said activist. And she said, what's it? She's eight. And she said, what's it? What's an activist? And I said, well, it's someone this and this and this. And she goes, oh, I'm a tree activist. And I was like, hell yes. <laughs> Fuck yeah, that's awesome. Um, but it's really, I don't know. It, it's really frustrating to to experience something so tremendous and not go like I don't understand but my point to her was like it's you can't just fight for trees like you also have to try to change the system because it's like saying like yeah we should have 100% clean energy of course but politics are complicated we've got to fix those as well it's a it's a two front fight here um so that was my point with 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 the Mayo side again it's very easy to feel like oh my god I'm being taken care of but also like what the hell are we doing? Like, how could you not be mm-hmm. angry in that situation to understand that, like, we only got in because a friend was able to get us in there. Like, that's crazy. You know, no one can yeah. no one can experience that level of care. It's crazy. Yep. Or any level of yep. care. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, certainly, yeah, I have my own corresponding experience because I, you know, I live in New York and I, I go for sort of regular cancer checkups at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which <clears> is, you know, there there is no better place to get no, cancer space care. Age. Yeah, yeah, it's I, right, and you do. I sort of feel this like scent, like I like go to the hospital and like take a little picture of the sign and like text it to my friends, like, "Oh, I'm here," and they're like, "What? Like, who cares?" Like, yeah, but anyway, right. I, you, you know, so there's definitely sort of a fangirl um, aspect. I will say, even there though, you know, you see the boundaries sure. of our medical knowledge. I think you know, like they're the, it's sort of like, well, can you screen for these cancers I'm at high risk of? And the the answer is kind of like, well, for some of them, no, not really. Like we yeah. just don't. We don't know how to do that yet, and you know, I'd like to. I'd like to be part of the like. Okay, now we know how to do that. It is a hell of a thing. We've experienced some things lately, and I think a lot of folks, millions of folks, dealing with something like long COVID, uh, are experiencing what a lot of folks who are immunocompromised or have recurring pain have experienced, which is like the process of elimination is both great, uh, you know, and difficult because hopefully, yes, you cross off some pretty rough stuff early on that we can, that we have clear black or white tests for. But on the other hand, it makes you go, okay, but what the hell is it? And it's pretty hard to believe in knowledge and science and all these tools and all these incredible things we can do for the best of the best to go, yeah, I don't know. And yeah. to say like, yeah, we can't really figure that out. Maybe it's this. And then you talk to someone else and they go, mm, not, not sure. And you go, you're it. That's it. This is the top. Like, <laughs> right. And again, this, yeah. it's this feeling of, yeah. like you said, then you dial it back down to this work you did. And, and I want to dig into this more about pain. And, and I've tried to cover here, um, you know, black maternal health, maternal health in, in general in the United States, which is an atrocity, and black maternal health, which is a nightmare, and, and how even women like Serena Williams and Beyonce just suffer so greatly. Um, it doesn't matter your, your wealth or your fame, apparently. Um, but just these two opposite sides of, of, of the puzzle. Um, so when I was reading your pain paper, it, it seemed like, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it somewhat referencing like the scale when you go in the doctor's office and it's like point to the, the face of, of what your pain feels like is like, is that sort of part of the association when you, when we're asking, trying to say, Oh, from this x-ray, it's maybe this level of pain. Can you explain that a little more? Cause that feels like one of those problems where I go, I do not know where to start with this. Like how does one try to. Understand right, right. Right. This? Yeah. The actual, the actual, uh, pain scale we ask the model to predict is it's what's called the Coos pain score. This is used for knees specifically, so it's not like that generic okay. thing. Okay, got it, got it. And, got it, it. and it basically asks patients how much how much pain do you feel when like walking up the stairs, when doing you know sort of various activities at various levels okay. of strenuousness. 
So it's mm-hmm. specific and kind of standardized. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's for for knees specifically. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then, yep. How do you get into to that side of the data, sort of the, the medical data? Because you've got, I've been talking to a lot of folks about you know what a nightmare sort of clinical trials are for again a huge variety of very complicated reasons here, versus somewhere like in the UK, which again imperfect, um, but data collection is opt out when you're born uh, for the NHS, which turns out solves a lot of, a lot of problems. Again, very imperfect, but we saw in COVID, like they were able to run some trials very quickly on data they just inherently had that we would have yep. an impossible time getting in for a thousand different reasons. Um, but I'm curious, knowing that and how fragmented it is and how unstandardized it is, even now with Epic having whatever, 80% of the market, how do you again, like the police data, start to approach them and go like, I need this specific sort of thing to try to answer this kind of question because it, it's a mess. Yeah. I mean, med- medical data in the United States is a mess, as you know, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that it's highly decentralized and people don't want to share it. We have very restrictive privacy laws, which can make it hard to share. It. There are enormous institutional barriers to do so. There are financial barriers, you know, reasons people don't want to give you their data, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, in the particular case of the, 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 the pain study, um, you know, the data comes from an NIH funded study and the data is essentially publicly available. And it was enormously important to our research. Um, and uh, another reason it was really important is because the authors of the study, to their credit, had gone to specific lengths to collect sort of a racially and socioeconomically uh, diverse data set, which was like crucially important for what we were trying to do. You know, we were trying to study racial disparities in pain. Um, and, you know, both both of those things, you know, without a data set like that, the, the study would not have been possible. Like we needed x-rays uh, linked to pain uh, and to various other measures of knee health. Uh, and it had all those things and it was racially diverse. And, I, you know, I think broadly there is a push uh, in the United States to sort of make larger data sets more easily available to more folks, uh, including by my collaborators. Uh, and, you know, that's going to be enormously important, like me- medical medicine is definitely an area where sort of making large data sets available to these models is going to be a crucial aspect uh, of progress. It's not just about the size of the data set, by the way. It's also like, you know, having sort of diversity in like what hospital was it taken at, you know, what demographic groups was it taken at, because otherwise what happens is you end up with a model that was trained on this one, you know, Boston hospital on all white people or whatever, and then it gets deployed much more broadly and bad stuff happens. Well, and that seems to be, and and again, I've been trying to understand sort of the bottlenecks, uh, the systemic bottlenecks, whether intentional or not around so much of the clinical trial stuff. Um, uh, And it seems like, again, traditionally, for a variety of reasons, it turns out we'll have tested medicine on a very, um, you know, limited data set, a not diverse data set. Um, and again, that's that's for a thousand other reasons. Um, but we have to do better there. But it was interesting uh, doing some reading on um, some folks, and I'm forgetting the gentleman's name. I'll send it to you later. Uh, talking about maybe we're asking too much of these clinical trials, like trying to find every data point out of these things, and it makes it hard to recruit. It makes it very incredibly expensive. I mean, these things are un- unbelievable. Um, and in ones where, like, an Apple Watch isn't going to get it done yet because that's still incredibly limited and unproven, and it's not an FDA device, you know, it, it just seems like we could do more if we actually simplified what we're looking for. Am I understanding that right? Do you mean in the case of getting data from clinical trials or? I think it, that that's the idea of like getting data from clinical trials where they say like it's so hard to get these off the ground because everyone starts adding, well, we need to try to factor these 10 things and, you know, these comor- comorbidities and, 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 and uh, this lifestyle thing and, and all this. And they're like, but that's not actually the question we're trying to answer. And so it's like the enemy of uh, done is perfect or, or whatever it is, you know? <laughs> whatever the saying is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I've worked with, I, I actually don't, have not really worked with data from clinical trials, so I'm less well-placed uh, to, to comment on that. Um, but definitely, I think, you know, with respect to machine learning, like ha- having more sort of actual clinical trials of the efficacy of algorithms would be, you know, great in, in rolling these things out, actually, and, and being sure that they actually work. Well, and... and the, it kind of comes down to this idea, and again, my wife talks about it with making a movie. It involves hundreds of people, I mean, if not thousands of people, and now you've got all these executives involved and this much money and egos and all this, and, and which yep. she always, part of the reason I think she's successful, besides being the greatest human alive, is, is she always tries to point people towards the point of, our goal is to get the movie made, you know? Uh-huh. Everything else has to answer to that, and that's one of the reasons I really love um, 
uh, Mariana Mazzucato's, uh, she has this book, oh gosh, Mission-Based Economy, I think it's called. And the whole point is we need a very clear, measurable outcome and we reverse engineer everything else to that. It's like, put somebody on the moon and bring them home. Like, that is very <laughs> transparent and measurable. And everything else, your teams, your decisions, your budgets, everything else, if it paint color is not going to do that, land them there and get them home, it's out of here. Like, that's it. And obviously yeah. that's can be simplistic, but the whole, like, get the movie made is like everything's got to go towards that. And I understand you feel this way about that or the budgets, this or that. But it seems that way for the clinical trials too. It's like if we're not running these because we're making them too complicated, we're not getting what we need out of them and more people are going to suffer. And it, the whole system is going to cost us more. And it seems that that seems to be applicable when, you know, like your uh, the, the incredible um, super spreader research you did with the mobile uh, phone data and things like that, like, these are actionable things we, we need to try to undertake here. and We have to do this work. Yeah. 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 I mean, I definitely think single mind, like being single minded about like, what are the decisions I'm going to seek to affect? And like, how can I sort of, you know, do so in a rigorous sure. way? I think, I, th I think that's crucial. Yeah. And at the same time, like we have to be more broadly inclusive of these things, you know, it's, 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 an, it's, it's a complicated one. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that one, the mobile, phone data one and the mobility one it was it early 2020 you did that uh late 2020 yes yeah no uh feels like 600 years ago i know i know i know uh we started that work in about march to april 2020 and i this is this is actually work uh led by my partner who i would say in terms of of single-mindedness is is a is a force of nature in 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 that regard so yeah basically what the project does the project uh seeks to model um the spread of, of COVID-19 using large scale data on human mobility. So like obviously mobility profoundly affects uh, how, sure. how the disease spreads, right? People in the same room, bad things happen. Sure. Um, so what, what we did was we took sort of cell phone data, uh, sort of tracking how people flow from neighborhoods uh, to places like, you know, people from the Bronx go to this bar or something like this, but then imagine that multiplied by literally a billion. So a network with like 5.4 billion hourly edges of so big, big networks. Uh, you know, we use machine learning to kind of infer those networks, tracking the flows of people over time. And then what you do is you put an epidemiological model on top of those networks, basically modeling, you know, if you have like all these people from neighborhood A and neighborhood B meeting in this bar, and this is how big the bar is, and this is the fraction of people who are sick from each of those two neighborhoods, how would you expect disease transmission to occur in that bar? Okay, then you do that a gajillion times to sort of forecast the spread of the disease hour by hour. And once you have a model that can do that, um, and we fit that model sort of from very early COVID data, right? Because that's when we were doing the work, sort of March to May or something sure. like this. Yeah. Uh, then you can ask a whole bunch of questions like, you know, what might happen if you reopened restaurants? Like why are yeah. poorer neighborhoods getting infected at higher rates? What mobility patterns are giving rise to this? And it was, it was such an invaluable time to do that work, right? Because the end was everyone on earth <laughs> and, and there were, you know, w what seems lost. And, and again, there's been such a hubbub understandably about, you know, the stories we tell ourselves and each other now about what happened the past three years and the decisions that were made is to understand that it became infinitely more complex as it went on. Cause the second people started getting infected and not dying and the second people started getting this shot or that shot or this many shots or this, the factors became innumerable almost at, at that point. So yes. what the research you did is really just so important. Um, I want to talk though for a second because, and I want to understand and help folks understand because one of my favorite publications is The Markup. I'm not sure if you're familiar with their work. They do incredible journalism. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, they talk a lot about geolocation data and data brokering and what a nightmare it is and how we don't have any privacy laws basically yep. and yep. things like that. Yep. How do you go about finding that data, but using it, first of all, making sure it's anonymized, but also using it in an ethical way, I guess for, for the, for the light, not the dark side. Um, but are there places that, that are able to do that? That's, I want to seek to understand that because again, there could be students or researchers are out there who are going like, Hey, I'm trying to do the right thing. But at the same time, like I want to make sure I'm not, you know, breaking a bunch of laws or, 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 or going down the privacy rabbit hole. 
Yep. I mean, I would say first that the way geolocation data, and to be clear on what that is, that's sort of like data on exactly where you go. Sure. You know, so each data point would be like latitude, longitude, time time point, uh, inferred from your cell phone. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think like the broad way that's regulated in the United States is a shit show. It is embarrassing. Yeah. Like the, the you know, it is, it is, and uh, so, so I think, you know, this is a major problem. This needs to be improved. There needs to be better regulation of this data. And I think a lot of what is currently legal to do probably should not be legal to do. You know, I was yeah. reading a story in the Washington Post today about how, like, the Catholic Church was tracking the whereabouts of gay, uh, of the gay priest. priests. Using, and it's and it's like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> what? Are you serious? So, um, and, and, and so as a social scientist, um, you know, I'm conflicted. Because on the one hand, I have deep disagreements with the way this data is collected and regulated. On the other hand, it is clearly invaluable for a lot of really important health and social science questions. Um, and so you're sort of always fighting fighting this tension in this battle. What I would say is, in terms of how I reconcile it, um, for one thing, a lot of this data that you get is in aggregated form, which is to say, it doesn't tell you, like, you know, Emma Pearson went to the grocery store and then she went to the hospital and then etc. Rather, it tells you, you know, uh, on March 8th, 50 people from this neighborhood went sure. to this hospital, which is a lot less sensitive. And that, in fact, is how we do all the COVID work. It's all on aggregated data. Um, and, you know, we make no attempt to trace individuals. And I don't even know if, if you could if you wanted to. Um, you know, I've also done work on individual level mobility data. And there, you know, it is much more sensitive. And yeah. I, I am much more conflicted. And I think the way I think about it is it's always sort of a conflict between how important is the question you're seeking to answer? Sure. Uh, and, you know, is there another means via which you could answer it? Um, and I definitely am, am ambivalent about it. And it's actually something I talk to my colleagues a lot about. It's interesting because that last point of like, how important is the question we're trying to answer? And how many, I guess, you know, the byproduct of that is how many people are historically or currently affected by this or something like COVID, yep. which is everyone, we need to know this. But also, is there any other way to go about this? And it goes back to sort of the beginning of our conversation, which is we're able to do a lot of this work for the first time. And it's both yep. very tempting then to use this data um, because it's so powerful and, and, and so encompassing. Um, but at the same time, it's also tempting to go like, holy shit, we might be able to answer this question for the first time and, and, and thus hopefully help some folks or point towards some ways where these inequities are, are, are structurally designed or... We didn't know. We just didn't know. And look, we could we could fix this. Um, you know, it's kind of like when Atul Gawande wrote his uh, the checklist manifesto, and you go like, if only we had known that <laughs> like literally making checklists could save lives in hospitals, type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it brings me back to the to the health side because again, you see, you know, so many of the stories about, and and I try to shout it from the rooftops about, oh, this. The Instagram ad you got for the mental health thing, just sign into it and it'll great. And uh, some therapist will talk to you. Um, oh, but also they were selling your data. And it's like, God damn it. Can we just like we, we've got to do better again, like this data could be so useful. But at the same time, like there has to be better regulations about this. Like it's it's crazy because we're both hindering these tools or we're letting these tools straight out of the box with with zero trust around them whatsoever. It's just Anyways, that's my rant. It's incredibly frustrating. No, it is frustrating. I mean, I will say on a more optimistic note, I think there are data collection efforts which are exemplar uh, in, in, in their efforts to protect, you know, privacy and sort of be meaningful about consent. So an example of this would be like, you know, there's there's something called the All of Us Research Study. Yeah, run love by it. The NIH. It's, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and I was using the data as uh, a researcher and then I was so impressed by sort of their consent and privacy processes that I actually, I went and signed up for it as a participant, you know, nice. just to kind of find, you know, and so now they have my DNA and I guess my PhD students have my DNA, um, <laughs> which I, now that I think about it, might get a little weird, but anyway, you know, yeah, I trust yeah. my students, uh, <laughs> which is to say, I think there are people who are seeking to do better. Um, and, and I agree with you, you know, it is, it's the people who, who abuse, um, the power and granularity of these data sets without adequate user consent, you know, they're, they're poisoning the well for the rest of us, in addition just to like committing massive privacy violations in, in and of themselves yeah again and again it almost seems like this um such a huge opportunity for us to especially in in this late covid stage for to look around and go there's so many opportunities in, uh, both comprehensively more broadly with with uh with all of us but uh, sector by sector wise to look and say for people to do good say hey we're going to collect this data 
you know, but we're going to be incredibly transparent about it as much as we can. And this is who we're licensing it to. And this is what it's used for and all these things. Because again, like we can do these things. We can do incredible things for the first time. And we need to do these things for the first time, even if they fail or they don't come up what we thought, which is just how science works. But we've got to start setting examples of how it can be used you know, in a, in a in an actionable way, but also in a in the most reputable way humanly possible, right? Because right now it's it's a little frustrating to see that trending in the other direction. But um, maybe later, uh, I would love any examples uh, you could send of, of of policy shops or whoever it is that are that are collecting this sort of thing and, and sharing it in a in a reputable way. Um, that's really interesting. That's really helpful. Yeah. Um, so here's a question for you. With everything going on, and, and this has been written about a lot, and I want to talk a little bit about your team, uh, if, if you could. It's easier to say, like, the AI made this decision. We don't know, and it's a black box and this and this. The algorithm, sort of that third piece, right? The chips are done. We've talked about data. The algorithms. It's easy to say, like, well, the algorithm, you know, identified, uh, you know, black people as chimps or whatever it might be, or, or Bing was crazy and, and tried to break up a guy's marriage, whatever it is. They're written by people. Right. And so we bring who yep. we are to these things. And that's why it does obviously matter so much who are at these companies. Is there a chief liberal arts person at these companies saying, should we do this? Who's going to be affected? Who gets to make these decisions? Who gets to make the decisions about who's making the decisions? How do you um, build a team and choose collaborators knowing that that is such a vital part of the process, knowing that that you are really responsible for not just choosing the data, if you can find the data you need, but executing on it, and who gets to make those calls. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's crucial. I mean, uh, I, you know, it's very clear that people's life backgrounds, at least very clear to me, both from my own anecdotal experience and just from seeing the research field, is like it's obvious to me that people's life backgrounds um, influence the data science problems they choose to pursue and how they pursue them, right? And you know, a, perhaps a canonical example of this is, you know, Joy Gualamwini, like, observed that, you know, a computer vision system didn't recognize her face unless she wore a white mask, right? Because they, they didn't perform well on darker-skinned women. And then she goes on to do, like, a series of sort of yeah. seminal and world-changing studies uh, on on this, which really have influenced the way major tech companies are, are marketing and, you know, producing these products. Um, and that was sort of intrinsically the, the you know, the the seed of that project was intrinsically her own personal experience. So I, I think it is absolutely um, a, a crucial aspect. And, you know, now that I've been afforded a small measure of power in academia, not very much, but slightly more than a PhD student, um, you know, I, I, I do absolutely try to recruit teams that are more historically diverse uh, in, in, in many ways, um, I think, than, than have been uh, has been possible in academia. I think I'm still not doing anywhere near as good a job as that as I, I'd like to, frankly. I, I think it's pretty, I, to sort of make a particular comment, I think it's particularly bad that many of the, the teams I've worked on where we were sort of working on questions of racial disparities, uh, they, they did not have a lot of black or Hispanic co-authors. You know, that's sort of a direct consequence of the lack of diversity in academia, but sure. it, it's clearly, like, it's, it's clearly undermines, I think, the work, and that's something that in particular we need to seek um, to remedy. But I but I think, you know, to the extent that I can choose collaborators um, on, on projects, I do, I do try and diversify the teams that work on these things. The other thing I think, as, as I've mentioned uh, earlier in this conversation, is really important is you need people with specific domain expertise in the domains sure. you know, you're seeking to do. Like right now I'm in the market for a geneticist, so if any of your listeners happen to be geneticists, I need a geneticist because I don't know anything about genetics. Um, and you, you know, they, like, th this problem uh, occurs constantly. So I think both in terms of sort of diversity of life experience and background, that's crucial to me, but also sort of diversity of like academic background and expertise in the specific area. Uh, both of those are instrumental. They're doing good work, and historically, computer science research has not been particularly good at either of those things. Yeah, I, I just I, I hope we can keep doing better on that front. But but like you said, it's a you know some of it so much of it is a structural pipeline problem, right? It's it's you know you can look around and not not find these folks, um, but also it's because they're not in academia. Okay. Why aren't they in academia? You know, we had conversations with a couple doctors at Johns Hopkins who, who uh, did some um, 
really interesting. They, they're surgeons, but also do studies on on why um, uh, on how black heart transplant uh, survivors fare compared to the rest. And it's like it's easy to say only five percent of doctors are black, and that's part of the problem. But um, it also makes you go like, boy, that is that is a very small number. And and when we talk about pain, and when we talk about maternal health outcomes, and all of these other things, um, you know that's got to be part of the discussion is like, why, why not? What is going on with medical schools? What is going on with obviously college and, and all these different things that we keep really shooting ourselves in the foot and, and continually hurting these uh, populations, you know, it's not like yeah, you can magically I mean, I th- I, make these candidates appear. Yeah, I think so. And I think also like to the extent that, you know, we, we do have any, any power to make, make decisions. And, you know, so, sometimes I do, I, you know, I think, I think it is, it's, it's on us not to just be like, Oh yeah, that's a pity, but like, that's upstream of me. Like, no, of course. There, you yeah. know, there, there are, there are decisions that we can personally make yeah. and then advocacies we can personally make. And like, there's a reason I'm making these comments on your, on your, on your 100%, podcast, yeah. for example, you know, so I, so, so I think, uh, yes, these issues are systemic, but at the same time, like I think we do, we do have efficacy and ability to, to change these things a tiny bit at a time, and I, I think it's incumbent on us to do so for for sort of the quality of, of the work itself and the rigor of the work itself. One of the things I one of this, in fact, this all these incoming calls from folks uh, over the past couple of years with you know whether titans of industry or school teachers or whatever, go, what can I do? Um, and you know it was very early, easy in COVID if you weren't doing the work you were doing to for the answer to be nothing. Stay home. It's very easy to feel impotent in that situation. It's very easy to feel impotent and frustrated or like, well, fuck it then, if the answers are, well, it's systemic. Um, And so I kind of settled on this idea of like, all you can do is all you can do. And it's this version of like, control what you control. But the idea being like, it's two parts. It's like, the first part, all you can do really needs to be, like you said, if you have any sort of agency or power whatsoever, like you said, as you're starting to gather power there, like, use it for all you got you know, um, because that is really going to be your sphere of influence. And these things are additive, right? It's, it's like the infuriating gatekeeping around, uh, climate action, for instance, people are like uh, individual actions, get people hooked. And it's like, no, those don't matter. Systemic stuff. It's like, Jesus Christ, we're not getting anywhere. It's like, you know, these we're, we're social beings. Like there's plenty of studies that say, if you have solar on your roof, I'm going to look at it and be like, shit, maybe I should get that. That's pretty cool. It works. Like, use what power you do have and it really does matter whether you're you're running a lab or you're or you're looking my one of my best friends works at a research hospital in southwestern virginia and and his entire job uh, for the past few years has been trying to get people to stop coming into the emergency room so often right um because uh it's costly to them it's costly to the system it clogs up beds but it also makes you step back and go why do they keep coming back and part of the answer is they don't take their medicine they leave doctor mm-hmm. tells them Hey, Jeff, you've been here three times in the past six months. Take these pills. You don't have to come back. You won't get the bills, this and this. Um, But he's trying to use that there. It can seem like small potatoes in the general scheme, but it is applicable everywhere. And hopefully we can build on those things like you're building on yours. So before we get to the last couple questions, I do have to ask, what are your sort of white whales, if there are are any, um, and, and, and what are the specific obstacles there where you're like if only what's I a could... white whale sorry sorry i don't know the idiot. oh white whales i'm Me so sorry Mo- moby dick moby dick what's what 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 yeah, i'm it... not a liberal arts major the, that's thank know. god oh, i mean jesus there's enough of us oh my god <laughs> well, i'm so <laughs> you please don't um moby dick uh it is um what what are what are the what are the either the problems or the questions uh, that are out there that you're like one of these days i'm i'm coming for you and either you're missing a team member a geneticist uh, right? Like you just hinted at, or you're missing data where you've been like, that's not good enough yet, or I don't know where to get it. But are there any lingering big ones out there that you're like, when I get there, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to tackle this one. Is there anything sticking out? Maybe you can't talk about them, but I'm curious. No. Yeah. It's a good question. So, so I would say in my field of medical machine learning broadly, I think the central and critical challenge is how do we go beyond? We have algorithms, which are very, very good at making predictions yeah. to okay, so now fewer cancer patients are like dying too young. Like we need, we need to close the gap between, in theory, this is predictably useful to, okay, patient outcomes are actually better. I think that is sort of the central overriding challenge, which yeah. our, our field is sort of on the cusp of confronting. In terms of problems that personally compel me, um, 
you know, I, I think I'm viscerally compelled by certain uh, problems in sort of women's uh, and maternal health that I, that I didn't do as much work on in PhD as I wish I could. Um, those problems include, you know, I'm very interested in, in a variety of, of cancers that disproportionately affect women, including breast and ovarian cancer. Um, I've you know, always been very compelled by intimate partner violence. And that's a problem I've just started to work sure. on. It's sort of one of those problems where you sort of feel that like Darth Vader, like rage uh, about, or maybe yeah. Darth Vader doesn't get angry, but I, let's I, go with know, it. Whatever. It'll be anyway, great. Anyway, let's go with it. Gotta He's be right. Angry. I mean, why else? Yeah. Anyways. Right. Like the Sith, like the Sith. hundred percent. Anyway, Different conversation. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Move no, on. never um, apologize for a Darth Vader reference. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and and then I think also you know problems around maternal health, like you mentioned, the striking racial disparities around maternal health, which are you know are sort of they're outrageous, they're enormous, they're unconscionable, um, and I I think that you know and and stuff around like like the enormous prevalence of stillbirths in the United States, which are sort of sh- shockingly high, and yeah. you know if you actually think about what kind of experience that is, you, you know, um, like so so I think more. problems like those are sort of particularly emotionally compelling to me. What is missing for you to be able to tackle those besides bandwidth? Um, I think I think often it is data issues. That is that is one issue. Like how do you sort of get access to the data? And then I think the the other problem um, can can often be um, you know what what actually is the right angle on this on this problem for a machine learning person to work on. So for example, stillbirths are an enormously upsetting problem. The question is what actually is the predictive target um, that that one should look at? Why might we believe that there is signal here? How yeah. might that signal uh, informed decision making. Like these are very cold, very analytical questions, but yeah. they are crucial questions if you're going to actually work on this. Sure, sure. No, that's all very fair. Um, this has been fantastic. I could I could badger you for for hours, but you have you have world problems to solve here, so I won't I won't abuse uh, that uh, by any stretch. I got a last couple questions I ask everybody if you don't mind, and then we'll uh, we'll get you out of here, sure. Emma. Um, when was the first time in your life, and it could have been last week, though I, I doubt it, um, you dressed up as a chessboard when you were eight, um, when you felt either yourself or your team or your family together, whatever it might have been, the power of change or the power to move, sort of move the needle on something where you were like, oh shit, I can do this or I did this, however small it might have been, but it was the hook for you. I went one time def- it like. When I started using AI algorithms, you definitely, I, I got like kind of a little bit struck by lightning when I was a little kid. And um, the feeling of sort of wielding an AI algorithm, uh, there's sort of like a thunderbolt sort of Zeus <laughs> feeling kind of. And, and I think I'm, I'm still a little bit hooked. I'm still a little bit hooked on that feeling, which maybe I had for the first time when I was, I don't know, 17 or 18 years old. That's how I feel using literally basic, like if I am able to get the cells to work and in like Excel and it, I get the oh, average thing to work yeah. and the number comes out, I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> See, I'm still not at that stage with Excel, frankly. So there you go. Yeah. I think it's fine. I think you're going to be okay. It's, it's okay. Yeah. Um, Emma, who is someone in your life that has positively impacted your work in the past six months? Oh, um, can I say my girlfriend? I, uh, Are you kidding me? I just talked yeah, about my wife for 45 uh, minutes. Of course you can say your girlfriend. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I mean, she's a, she's also a computer scientist and, um, she's just better at a lot of, a lot of things than I am, frankly. Um, I don't know. You know, she makes all, all my, all my work better. She asks questions I don't, I don't think to ask. She makes prettier figures than I do. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. She's really good at her job and, uh, and, and I'm, constantly grateful for her feedback i love that um where would we be without our partners i I truly i i I joke to my children who i think maybe this is too dark but i'm just i like guys i wake up in the morning i look over and i'm like mom's still here that's so great uh and they're like what's your what's your deal buddy and i'm like no she's amazing but that's the whole thing right it's like uh, we 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 are so lucky if in a relationship uh whether it's friends or, or partners or whatever, when you feel like you both feel like the lucky one. Right. And, yeah. uh, I like to think I that like my that. wife, I'd like to think that my wife still feels the same way. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see, but I know I'm I, sure she does. So I'll get it. Mm, I don't know. The other day they were like, Hey, so is mom still like into the beard or how come she lets you keep that? And I was like, guys, I don't think she cares. anymore. 
I think we're well past that. <laughs> like we, we've that used to be like on the list of things. Now the list is much longer and, and more annoying. So yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, Emma, what is a book you have read uh, in the past year or so that's either opened your mind, uh, maybe a topic you hadn't considered before, um, or actually changed your thinking in some way? We got a whole list up on Bookshop that people love to check out. Um, this is squarely in my field of expertise, and that's why I'm so impressed by it. Um, it's the Alignment Problem by by, by Brian so Christian. Good. You, yeah, you. It it really is. It's nice to read someone who's just a qualitatively much better writer than you are, and uh, the the way he explains complex technical topics is um, it's formidable. It's 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 really pretty dazzling. I think. It was formidable to me as like a moron from the outside. I can't. I, I imagine for you, like it's exceptional. No, he's just really good at what he does. Yeah. Exceptional <laughs> writers, one like anything I tell my children, takes a lot of practice. We aren't, you know, just necessarily always born born that way. But it both makes me like so impressed, super jealous, and like really bummed at times. But almost like I mean, just I'm just thankful to exist. But yeah, that book changed a lot yep. uh, for me. Yeah. Um, yep. That's kind of where I come at these questions of like why it matters so much who who is who is doing the building blocks of the teams and the algorithms and choosing the data and what's in the data and all of those different things because again it always it's like it's us that's the thing yep. it always comes comes back to us um, Emma where can our listeners follow your work should you choose um, support it in any way maybe maybe not uh, just read things uh, how can they keep up with all things Emma to the extent that they want to um you can follow me on twitter at two plus two make five and that has a that has a link to my website as well okay rock and roll well I cannot thank you enough uh for your time today this is uh, truly wonderful I feel like I could like I said I could I could badger you for forever and I'm so thankful for the work you're doing um you know reading your uh, like your list of, of papers and, you know, you see how much you've been cited in this and this. But for me, it's like it's easy to get greedy and look at this, go like, I hope she does this next and maybe she'll do this and maybe she can do this because it's like these are – it's great to do nuanced stuff that is like in a very small field that nobody cares about. But it's another thing, and that's all great too, but it's another thing to have someone who's constantly like here are the things that matters and I'm going to go after them because I have the tools and I think I can build the team to do that. And that's – tremendously inspiring so thank you no thanks so much for taking the time great questions this was a pleasure and that's it you can read our critically acclaimed newsletter and get notified about new pods at importantnotimportant.com where we've also got fantastic t-shirts hoodies coffee mugs stickers and more um i'm on twitter if it's still around at quinn emmett we are also on linkedin you can search my name or the company there uh, you can always send me feedback, or questions, guest suggestions, anything like that on Twitter or at questions at importantnotimportant.com. Thanks for giving a shit. <laughs>